Um, you guys have already sent in so many good questions and you can continue to submit your questions. I'm getting them directly to my phone. Again, 703-844-9969. Um, and we're going to take the next 45 minutes roughly to just have a time of question and answer. And again, these questions can vary um, from questions particularly pertaining to Pastor Brian's message about what it actually means about uh us being a holy priesthood now in this new covenant and how all that works. The questions can be about relationships, singleness, dating, and marriage. Um, the questions can be about cultural questions or just simply how do I walk with the Lord and discern God's will for my life. And so, uh, Pastor Brian, I want to start with this question because it will kind of um, bleed in a little bit to your own testimony and your, and your own story. And so there are two different questions that are somewhat similar. And the first question, Pastor Brian, is how do you remain strong in the faith as a believer when you don't have that priest in your home, mm -hmm. um, the priest of the household, which is your father, your dad? Yeah. Um, and so first question, Pastor Brian, is um, there are some of us in the room who um, we have a father in the home, but he's not really the spiritual leader. Mm. And so he's kind of just an absent father. And as you said in one of your, in your message, I believe last night, you know, us as, as dads, we're called to be the, the shepherds or the priests of our home to spiritually lead our homes. And some of us in this room, uh, we don't really have that. And that directly relates to your story. Yeah. Um, the other question, Pastor Brian, that is, is similar. Um, someone says that God is changing a lot in my life right now, um, and I'm going through a rebirth. You know, the Bible says that we are to be born again. And what does that mean? Well, you've been born physically, but the Bible also says that we need to experience a spiritual rebirth. We need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit and be reborn. So someone has made that decision to trust in Christ, but it seems like they're the only one in their family who's really following after the Lord because yeah. uh, they say that... Um, that they're going through a difficult season right now um, where their family really isn't following after the Lord like they are. Um, and so how do the question is, how do I keep stress free and actually enjoy this season of my life where um, there's some loneliness there spiritually uh, because the family uh, doesn't know the Lord like they do. So can you kind of speak to that and, and weave it into your own personal story? Yeah. Okay. So go back to the first part of the question, which so, was, how do I maintain, you know, a, a pursuit of the Lord coming from a, an environment where there was no spiritual leadership? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So number one, um, I had to learn in my own life. So I grew up without a dad. So that's part of what my book is about, right? And why I can kind of get into the importance of fathers in our society, fathers in the home. I have a whole chapter that says what fathers bring to the table, right? And what God calls fathers to be. I remember in uh, the book of Job, the scripture says that Job being a good man in his generation. Uh, he was a faithful man. And the Bible says, I, I was one part of the text just grabbed me, right? And again, like when I read the Bible, I'm asking God to show me what is your Bible, was the word show me about you, God. And the Bible says that Job would pray and go before God and offer sacrifices for his family daily, for each one of his children. I had that on my head because it was cold. Uh, for each one of his children daily. And just in case that they had sinned against the Lord, that he would go. And so when I talk about this whole idea of men and fathers being priests of their home, you're called to pray on behalf of your children. The scripture does, I mean, well, scripture teaches us that's important, but even statistics, society teaches us that a man in the home who's a follower of Jesus Christ, 85, 85 times more likely your children are to follow the Lord versus if there's no man in the home, they're 25% likely. So even just that presence of a faithful man in the home actually increases the likelihood of your children being followers of God. So to your point, how do I make it in an environment where I don't have spiritual leadership? Number one, I had to stop, make, stop making excuses because I had the truth available to me. I had been in a church. I had been in a youth group. I heard the word of God. And I was like, okay, God, this is a, 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 you know, a deficit in my life, right? Spiritual leadership, I don't have it. But I'm not gonna sit here and make excuses because I have truth. And so what I had to start doing was operating on the truth that I knew operating on the gospel truth that had been presented to me. And I started to seek. The Bible says, if you seek, you will find. Knock, he says, is it, and, and the, and he says as, as the Lord is knocking at your door, 
He says, if you let him in, he's going to come in and sup with you, right? If you seek, you'll find, and the doors will be open to you. So I started pursuing the Lord at the level that I understood and knew. I began to seek out mentorship. I began to seek out faithful men, right, who could teach me. I began to attach myself to people that I knew were faithful. Well, you say, well, that's all well and good, Pastor Brian, but what if I don't even see that? What if I go to a horrible church, right? Well, that can't be true of you if you go to Cornerstone. But, um, but what if I'm in an environment where even in the church it's hard to find men, good men? Listen, find a, you know, get online and find a good uh, Bible teacher that you can just listen to. I actually, for years prior to become, coming into a faithful church, I got online and listened to one of my favorite preachers who I knew was a sound Bible teacher, and I could get online and download his sermons for free. And for years, I had a faithful pastor online just teaching me what it meant to be a disciple of God. And he discipled me from afar until I got into a church. And I started following the Calvary chapels and, you know, and got into faithful churches that where I could see faithful pastors and teaching and so forth. And then I began to pattern myself in that way. So what, what, am I, what am I saying? Attach yourself to the truth that you understand. Everybody has a Bible. Attach yourself to that. Find people in a local church somewhere that you know are faithfully walking with the Lord. Attach yourself to them. Ask them questions. Get after them, right? Pursue that. And I promise you, you do that. That's you. The Bible says that he that comes to God must first believe that he is, that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you diligently seek the Lord, I promise you, God's not going to turn you away. And regardless of what you don't have in your, your life, that's the beauty of being, being a believer in Jesus Christ. God, God gives you access to say you do have a father. The Bible says God places the lonely in families. Mm -hmm. And God is your father. Right. And your father will not leave you alone. He will guide you by the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you by his word to people. And he says he places them in fellowship and families that he'll bring you into fold and fellowship of people who will lead you in faithfulness. Yeah, that's so true, Pastor Brian. The, the, the Bible says that God is a father to the fatherless. And you need to be encouraged by that today. If you don't have that spiritual leader in the home, maybe your dad is absent, maybe you don't have a dad, um, or maybe you, your dad is there but um, isn't being the spiritual leader that he should be. The Bible says that God is a father to the fatherless and that he loves you. And I want to encourage those of you who are going through maybe a season of loneliness. Maybe you feel like you're the only one really following after the Lord. Um, I want to encourage you that God sees that and he knows it. And he will reveal himself to you in such intimate, special ways when you set your heart on seeking after the Lord. And when you go to the Lord and you're just open and transparent with him and you say, Lord, I, I feel alone in my walk with you. The Bible says that um, the Holy Spirit is the comforter and the counselor. And God, by his spirit, he desires to come alongside you. That's literally what in John 14, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit in the Greek, the parakletos. And parakletos in the Greek, it's two Greek words combined. And it literally means one who comes alongside us. And if you feel like you're alone in your walk with the Lord, God, by his spirit, will come alongside you and he will encourage you and reveal himself to you in such awesome, amazing ways like never before. There was a, a season in my life just a few years ago where I was kind of feeling sorry for myself, not saying that those of you who feel lonely are feeling sorry for your, yourselves, but this was just where I was a few years ago, kind of feeling sorry for myself and going through just this season of loneliness and I met with the Lord and the Lord revealed himself to, to me in such an intimate, powerful way. And I am so grateful that the Lord allowed me to experience that season of loneliness so I could experience the depths of a relationship with him like never before. And so press into that season. If you're feeling lonely, press into it and press into the Lord and get in the word. And he will reveal himself to you and speak to you and guide and direct you and give you clarity and wisdom and discernment by the Holy Spirit because he comes alongside us. And that's what he desires to do in your life. Um, I don't know how many of you know my, my dad's story. My dad's Pastor Gary. And, um, and he really doesn't share this um, very much. But um, my dad came from a divorced home. And um, his, his dad, who, who passed away a few months ago, um, his, his parents um, divorced when my dad was 13. And so my dad grew up in an environment where there really was no spiritual male role model in the home. 
and he doesn't really talk about it very much, um, but I want to just share that with you um, just as a source of encouragement. My dad didn't really have a strong spiritual role model in the home, but when my dad was 15, uh, he got saved at a, at a camp and um, had to kind of grow up really quickly. And the Lord met him in such a, a special way as, as a young adult. And um, he decided to pursue the Lord and to meet with the Lord, um, although he felt very lonely. And the Lord uh, did such an awesome and amazing work in my dad's life and led him and called him into the ministry. And my dad has been to me and my siblings what he didn't have. And that can be you too. Uh, although you might feel like I don't have that strong spiritual role model in my life, uh, when you get in the Word and pursue the Lord, the Lord will come alongside you and He will pour His Spirit into you and He will lift you and raise you up to be that to someone else. Amen. And um, and so I just want to leave you with that and encourage you with that Word. Um, I want to kind of talk a little bit more about your book, Pastor Brian, because um, you grew up kind of in that environment mm -hmm. and that's what led you in in a way to write this book and we actually have a short little video if our if our team could fire that video to set up this this book that you've Where's written a pillar pillar is a structure designed to bear a weight or to hold something up we also use that word in our culture to describe a person that reliably provides essential support in a community Fathers are, in fact, the pillars of our society. I wrote this book, Missing Pillars, because I really believe that this issue of father absence is a crisis in our nation. In America, 40% of all children are growing up without a present, active, consistent father in the home. 75% of those children are black children. 60% of those children are Native American. 50% of those children are Hispanic. And 35% of all of those children are white children. There are various organizations and agencies that have provided some startling statistics about the impact of the fatherless environment. President Barack Obama once said that a kid growing up without a father is five times more likely to be born in poverty, nine times more likely to have major problems in schools, and 20 times more likely to be in the prison system. 80% of all incarcerated individuals grew up without dads. I myself was raised by a single mother, and two out of three of those statistics were absolutely true about me and just about everybody that I knew who grew up in environments just like mine. Poverty was a reality. Crime and violence were high. Drug use was high. Teen pregnancy was high. And I began to say to myself, is there an end to this cycle in this pathology? Well, I was met with the answer, and the answer was the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel changed my life, and I began to see clearly that God has a plan for the nuclear family, a plan for the role of men in the home. God's church rallied around me to teach me about the kingdom of God and my purpose, which is to serve my creator. And I believe as humanity gets back to God's design and intention for the individual and the family, we will see change. One life, one community, and one nation at a time. Awesome. So Pastor Brian, talk a little bit about your heart behind this. Yeah, so I mentioned that my own life, right? Growing up without a father, I grew, I grew up with a lot of questions, right? Like, what's life all about? Like, why, why me, right? Anybody, like, we have this, why me? Why, did I, why am I born in this situation? Um, I grew up to a single mother who was a beautiful woman in the Lord, but she had struggles, right? And so she was struggling to find her way and trying to find the Lord's purpose for her life. But, the, you know, along the way, those struggles become struggles that impa impact, right? And that compound and affect children that are brought into the situation. And my father left the home as soon as I was born. He didn't wait until I was, you know, uh, you know, teenager or preteen. As soon as I was born, he split. He didn't want to deal with it. And so he abandoned my mom. Um, and I have a brother and a sister. We also uh, grew up together. So, um, so growing up with that pain, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, a common 
uh, cliche that says everybody has a father size hole in your heart. People grow up with a father size hole. You hear people that talk. Um, Tupac, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s. Anybody know, remember Tupac? Okay. Tupac once said, I guarantee you, if I, and he's famous for thug life, I want to be a thug. <laughs> And so, you know, he just walked around, you know, just lived his life in, you know, in the rap community, hip hop, you know, very famous. But he walked around with a hole in his heart, right? Thug life and womanizing, womanizing and, and, and misogyny and things like that. It became a statement he made. He said, I, I guarantee if I grew up with a father, I would have more discipline. I would have more self-confidence. And so he himself, with all that fame and all that notoriety, with all that attention in life, he had a father-sized hole in his heart. I wrote also a, 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 about a a case study in my book where this woman who's a lesbian, or I'm sorry, she wasn't a lesbian. She was raised by two lesbian women. And she said, you know, I thank God for the love that even the lesbian community and the lesbian or the gay community and the lesbian mom and mom that raised me, they gave me some love. But one of the things they could not give me was a father. I don't know how to, she said today, I don't know how to relate to men because I didn't see a man in my home, right? A mom can't teach a young boy how to be a man, right? And so that takes men. You know, the scriptures, uh, you know, one of the things I also cited in my book was in the Old Testament scripture, remember Jacob and Rachel were, were having a baby and Rachel's dying in childbirth and uh, Rachel is going to name the baby that she's having as she's dying. She's dying in childbirth. She's going to name the baby Benoni, which in the Hebrew means son of my sorrows. She was going to name this child out of the experience and the adversity that he was being birthed in. And that's oftentimes what happens. We go the trajectory of the misery that we're born in. And we say, and our situation tends to deter, determine, or we allow it to, or it tends to determine our purpose and the trajectory we go in. I'm born in the hood. I'm born in this situation. I'm born in, in this foolishness. So that's where I'm going to live. But just then the Bible says that Jacob stepped in and said, no, his name is not Benoni. His name is Benjamin. His name is not son of my sorrow. His name is son of my strength. His father named him and that set him on a trajectory that was totally different than what it could have been had his mother just given him that name, son of my sorrows. No telling what he could have been, right? And Benjamin became a very strong tribe of warriors, right, in Israel. And so I said that to say the Bible absolutely talks about how, you know, the father in a home is whose job is to teach his children the ways of the Lord, right? To make sure his children are going and, and, and as the scripture says, uh, uh, or fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. He says, but teach them and admonish them in the ways of the Lord. We can, we can provoke our children to anger by abandoning them, provoke our children to anger by abusing them. That's the power that a father has. A, fa a father has the power, and a mother does too, but a father particularly in a unique way has a sway over the emotional stability of their children. And so I saw all of that growing up. And so I said, you know what? I want to tell that story. I want to talk about the redemption that I found in the Lord. And like you said, what I began, what became fueled by the desire to be for my own children, what I did not get growing up. And so I wanted to tell that story. But in addition to that, so the first part of the book is, you know, I talk about, you know, kind of what's the state of society. I talk about my own story, but then I talk about some of those things that's going against the building of families and nuclear family, like woke ideology and CRT and all these things that the left is, is bombarding people with that. Listen, who, who, who wants to be a family person or father when you can be non-binary? That's, that's working against what fatherhood and manhood is, right? And who's going to be a strong father in the home when men are now being feminized and, and it's toxic to be a masculine man, right? And so I talk about a lot of that and why those things are waging war against the role of a father because Satan knows that a man in the home who's godly and who's doing the best, he's not perfect, but if he's godly and he's trying to follow the will of the Lord and he's trying to follow God's word, then that's, that's, that's a, 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 a very a strong right? Formidable power and force against the, the ways of evil in society. Listen, my children don't have the problems and, and your children won't have the problems that many, you know, people in society have. I never have to worry about the police bringing Bryce home in handcuffs. He's home or he's at work or he's at school because he's been raised in a disciplined, godly environment, right? I'm not the perfect dad, but I, I never had, the principal never had to call me because Bryce was disrupting a class or cutting up or doing whatever. I, I had confidence that when I sent my children out because my wife and I taught them and they, we, we feared them and reared them in the fear of the Lord. And so that's what, you know, I wanted to make sure that our society has a voice 
to say, listen, we don't need to abandon that. We don't need to let society convince us that men are useless and that there's no need to be married to, you know, in a, in a nuclear family situation. Yes, God ordained that and it blesses society. And I wanted to make sure that I talked about that. I love that. Yeah, my story is a little bit different. Um, I did get the principal called on me. Um, <laughs> You know, Pastor Gary, he just didn't do the good of a job, you know? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm a middle child, and we need to have some fun. So we get in trouble a lot. Um, so more, um, if you want to learn more about Pastor Brian's book, again, his, his book, Missing Pillars, is up at our merch table. Um, you know, we're, we're speaking a lot to, to, the, to the potential dads, um, to the men in the room, because um, really, women have stepped up in the church, and, and male leadership in the church is lacking. And so we as men, we, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to step up and to be leaders in the church. And, um, and that's what, what the church needs. And can I just say a word to you ladies and to you potential moms in the room or future moms in the room? Your, your role is just as vital. Listen, my, my mom, um, you know, while my dad is Pastor Gary and um, was that spiritual leader of our home, um, I spent more time really with my mom um, at home while my dad um, typically was, bit, was a bit busier. My mom was a teacher, and then when she started to have more kids, she uh, stayed at home with us kids. And my mom was really the prayer warrior, the one who um, really um, pr uh, prioritized family devotions with us kids. And I know, Pastor Brian, you've grown up with your mom who loved the Lord. Like We can attest to um, our moms who are so necessary in the home to pour into us and to pray for us and to raise us in the ways of the Lord as well. So ladies, you have um, a vital role um, in your homes, in your future homes, to lead your kids, to shepherd your kids, to love on them, pray for them, pray with them, open up the word with them. And my mom did that. And um, she was and is a prayer warrior. And we need ladies filled with the Holy Spirit to be that in the home as well. Um, and the Bible also talks about ladies mentoring ladies, mm. men mentoring men. And so we have that at the church. Ladies, if you um, need um, a role model or, or you're looking for that female mentorship, um, Grace, who is explaining our Olympics, um, specifically is that for our young adult ladies. So if you want to go grab coffee or pray with someone, Grace would love to do that with you, ladies. We also have women's one-on-one -on -one discipleship at the church. Um, in our women's ministry. Pastor Brian is ahead of our men's ministry. So for those of you men who are looking for that real role model, we have um, male discipleship. Um, yeah. Pastor Brian leads a Friday morning Bible study. We have different ways for us men to get involved as well and to surround ourselves with godly men to be poured into in that regard. Um, continuing in our Q&A, Pastor Brian, we're getting questions um, about just discerning God's will. Mm. And that's really a question that um, so many of us have in this season of our lives, in this decade of decisions, as I like to say, um, for those of us who are in our 20s and heading into our 30s, um, for those of us who are um, still in college or graduating from college, or we didn't go to college, we're heading straight into the workforce, or we're taking a gap year just trying to figure out, you know, what am I even good at or what is God's will for my life? Um, someone is asking, um, how did each of you learn to discern God's voice? And could you give first time examples of how you grew and learned how to grow in knowing God's will? So how did you, Pastor Brian, first learn to discern God's will for your life? What did that practically look like? And what's some biblical wisdom you can share with us on how to know what God's plan and will is? for our lives? So great question. What I started doing, just, just real talk, was I stopped trying to ask the question, what's God will for my life? The word of God tells us what there, there's a, a foundational will that God has for everyone. And so I said, okay, well, what does God's word say about the will of God? The scripture says, pray in everything, for this is the will of God concerning you. The scripture says, Live a life that is sexually pure. This is God's will for you. And so I started doing the thing. I stopped asking God about specific will questions because I know that's what we get at, right? Who should I, where should I go to school or what job should I take? Is this the person to marry? And all those, what's the will of God for my life? What's the specific ministry God's going to do? So out of that, I stopped asking that question about specific will purpose questions for me, right? 
as it relates to decision-making kinds of what is the will of God question. And I said, what is the will of, am I doing the very basic thing that God told me to do? Am I doing the stuff that I know he's already, without a shadow of a doubt, told me to do, which is to maintain a life of godliness, to maintain. And guess what? The Bible says that if a man's ways please the Lord, he will direct his very path. He'll give him the very desires of his heart. If the, if the real desire of your heart is to do the will of God, then what you're going to find yourself doing is trying to live in such a way. Again, I'm not talking about perfection. What I'm talking about is your direction. You're going to live in such a way that you're going to, you're going to pursue holiness and righteousness. You're going to pursue obedience. You're going to pursue, right, truth. And you're going to, at a basic level, foundational level, want to live in such a way that you present your body a living. I'm getting into my next message, right, for this afternoon. You're going to present your body a living sacrifice to the Lord, holy and acceptable to the Lord, right? And you do that. And at the basis of that foundation, out of that, the Lord's going to speak to you out of your obedience. And the Lord's going to start showing you things very clearly. And you're going to start walking into things that God, didn't, you didn't even, oh, I didn't even know. Like, listen, I'm telling you. Again, not that I was so perfect, but as, as I made just the pursuit of, I got to a place in my life where I was making a lot of decisions and doing things that I thought was right. Right for my family. I wanted to go in a particular, oh, should I move over there, God? Should I move here? Should I move there? And I just started saying to myself, after making a bunch of blunders, after, after messing it up a little bit, right? Because we do, right? And if we're candid, right? I was messing it up a little bit. And I said, God, I'm tired of making my own decisions. It's up to you. I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to surrender. I'm going to submit my heart to you. And God didn't come to me in a, in a voice that said, okay, now make a left turn here and go down Will Street. No, it, beca it began to become my consistent pursuit of obedience began a step in this direction, a step in that direction. And I began to hear through circumstance, I began to understand, okay, this is right for my family and it's not right and it's not based on my own pursuit. This is what's best for people around me, not just best for me. This is what God would have us do because it's a long-term better decision and it's not just benefiting me. It doesn't just look good on the outside, right? And so all of those, those, those shiny gold medal kinds of decisions that lure you and, 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 and makes you want to make that decision or try to entice you to go that particular way, it, it wasn't enticing anymore. And I began to see life through God's lens because I did begin to hear God's voice in a way that made, made more sense to me because it was based on, as I, as I mentioned earlier, me spending time with the Lord, I began to discern what God's voice sounds like, right? God's voice sounds selfless. God's voice sounds obedient. God's voice sounds holy. God's voice sounds like it's faithfulness to the church. I began to make decisions based on, is my family gonna be ministered to before the Lord if I make this decision? Right. And so out of that, I still needed to know, God, well, what decision should I make like right now in this moment? And because I made that the foundation of my, my choices. Right. What's best for my family? What's best for God's work? Am I going to is this going to lead me to being faithful to serving in the church? Or is this going to take me away from study? Is this going to take me away from Bible study? Is this going to take my family away from serving the Lord? But we're going to be good and we're going to be involved in sports. And it's not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. We're going to be involved in all those good things. And it's going to be a big salary. But are we going to be faithful to the things of God? I'd rather take a lesser salary and be faithful to the things of God and be closer to God. And when I made my heart that, God began to speak to me clearly. Ultimately, God led me to Cornerstone on staff here full time because I started saying, God, not my will, yours. And if I had done the things I wanted to do, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Yeah, that's super helpful. One of the verses that always comes to my mind, guys, is in the book of Matthew. Jesus would say, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, mm -hmm. and all these things will be added unto you. And, you know, I've talked about this before at Young Adults, but I want to continue really just to hammer this into our minds because it is so true. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Translation, when you first seek how to live rightly before the Lord, and your priority is how do I please the Lord and just be obedient and just live for God's kingdom, for God's righteousness, and not live for the here and now, then God says, when you first prioritize the vertical, I will take care of the horizontal. When you first prioritize seeking first the, his kingdom and his righteousness and living in a pleasing relationship with the Lord, then God's going to take care of the horizontal. He's going to take care of the relationships. He's going to take care of the, the, 
the, the, the dating and the, the marriage and the job and the career path. Because when your eyes are on the Lord, the vertical, he's going to take care of the horizontal. And so that's what the Bible calls us to do, as Pastor Brian was saying. We first have to be obedient to God's revealed will for us in the word of God before we then expect him to show us his unrevealed will. There's two, two different um, realms of God's will, his revealed will and his unrevealed will. His revealed will is what he already tells us to do in the scriptures, to live uh, in sexual purity, uh, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for this is God's will. Um, and so to live obediently, to live rightly with the Lord in this relationship, and that's his revealed will. So how can I expect God to show me his unrevealed will, where I should work, who I should date, who I should marry, if I'm not already first walking in his revealed will? That's what Pastor Brian's talking about. And so that's that should be my priority. I first want to get and dive into the scriptures and understand what has God already told me to do in the Bible, in his word. I'm going to follow after that, and then, then I'm going to trust that God is going to direct and guide my steps towards his unrevealed will. And so that's what I would encourage you with today. Um, an example in my own life, just to kind of bring some like practicality to it. Uh, I was in college, I was at Liberty, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. In all transparency, I've said this before, I went to Liberty because that's where this cute girl was going, and I followed her there. And it was our senior year of high school, and I met her at church, and I said, where are you going to school? She said, I'm going to Liberty. And I went home that night, and I said, Dad, I'm going to Liberty. <laughs> and he said, what? We've talked about that before. Like, what changed your mind? I thought you didn't want to go to Liberty. I said, you know, the Holy Spirit's been speaking in my life. <laughs> and no, it was this cute girl. I followed her there, and um, I forced her into marriage. And we're married now. We have three kids. Um, so I, I went to... Um, Liberty because that's where Morgan was going and I didn't force her into marriage. Um, she, he tricked her. Yes. Clearly she just saw how amazing I was. And, um, and so, no, I was, I was there at Liberty, but again, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And it was there at Liberty when I felt the Lord specifically calling me into ministry, but I had no idea what that looked like, what that meant because ministry can mean a lot of different things, um, and all of us have ministry. Uh, ministry isn't just necessarily full-time church ministry, but all of you have ministry at your schools or in your workplaces. But for me, I felt the Lord calling me into full-time ministry at the church, but that could, that could be missions, or that could be teaching the Bible, or that could be serving in our children's ministry or special needs ministry, um, or with our care team, praying with people, visiting, making hospital and home visits. So that, that is, is a very broad thing. But again, as I continue just to pray and seek the Lord and ask this question, Lord, what will please you today? The Lord then just gradually began to open up different doors and opportunities. And I wasn't manipulating my circumstances or forcing those doors down. I just wanted to please the Lord just on a day-to-day -day basis. So many of us get so paralyzed by the future because we are so overwhelmed with what do the next five years look like or what does next year look like or what, is the next, what do the next 10 years look like? And there's so much pressure from the outside to have everything figured out. Listen, I, I, I don't have everything figured out, but what I could do is just take one day at a time and wake up in the morning and say, okay, God, Help me to make decisions that please you today. Uh, Jesus would say, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. And so we're called as believers just to wake up and say, okay, today, God, I just want to please you. I just want to please you. Help me, give me wisdom to make decisions, God-honoring decisions that please you today. And as you live day to day, just with the desire to please God, he will begin to direct the uh, course of your life. And, and as you just want to just please the Lord, just, okay, God, I just want to please you. And, and um, trust me, I, I haven't always done that perfectly. Thank the Lord that he's so gracious and he corrects course because he's a good dad and he loves his kids. And again, the Bible paints God as our father. And a good dad, when we make mistakes, 
he, he redirects us, but we have to be sensitive to, to where he's leading. So we have to stay close to him by being in the word and, and being in prayer. But when we, when we go off course, he's gracious enough. He corrects course. But when you just wake up and just say, God, today, I want to please you. He will be faithful to do that. And as I've done that, not perfectly, but just today, God, I want to please you. Help me. Give me wisdom by your Holy Spirit. He's directed my, my life. And he, he's narrowed my, my course in ministry. And um, he's blessed me with a beautiful family. And the Lord has a unique will for your life. Not all of us are called to marriage. Marriage isn't the pinnacle of Christian success. But many of you will be called to marriage. You trust the Lord with that. You wake up today and say, God, I want to make God-honoring decisions to please you. I want to please you with my body, please you with my life. God will take care of the rest because you prioritize the vertical. He'll take care of the horizontal. You want to clean any of that? No, 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 you did great. I just wanted to add one thing to it because uh, when the scripture says, you know, he will give you, if man's ways please the Lord, he'll give you the very desires of your heart. And as Pastor Austin was saying, he said, listen, God will begin to put things into your heart as you're pleasing him, as you're living obediently, he'll begin to put things in your heart that actually become the right decision and the will for your life. Yeah. It says, he says, the, a man's ways please the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart because your desires will begin to align with God's desires right. for you, right? And he'll start now leading you by desires and the things that you become passionate about because now your passions become his passions. So good. As we're continuing kind of this conversation about relationships, Pastor Brian, someone's asking this, um, in relation to your side sermon yesterday, okay. where you took us through the tabernacle, <laughs> which I'd never heard that before. That's pretty cool. Um, so someone's asking in relation to your side sermon yesterday, uh, where you talked about the symbolism between the tabernacle and the process and progression of a biblical relationship. Uh, they're asking, I'm curious on what would you say to someone who has a muddied past? Mm. Um, like sexually, mm. um, and they're asking, you know, what about mercy, grace, and redemption? Isn't that important also? How does someone move forward in a new relationship when they have a messed up past? That's a great question. And forgive me if I uh, gave you the sense that I was saying that you needed to be perfect to have a perfect relationship, because mm -hmm. that's absolutely not the case. Yeah. I'm case in point, right? I'm not. I married my wife. She was a virgin. She was not with anyone before I married. I, unfortunately, was a wreck in my sin, right? So I had a muddy past, right? However, it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. So it's not that someone's past dictates where you're going. It's if your past is not rectified and you're not submitted to the Lord and you're not truly born again, that determines how it could lead to a wreck of a relationship. If you have someone who's gone through past trauma and past relationships or things that they are bringing into a relationship as baggage that's not been placed under the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ and that they're submitting to the Lord and that they're growing and being sanctified daily through, then yes, it's going to be a train wreck. You got to make sure the person that you're with is dealt with their stuff. So have conversations. And that's why it's so important, guys, not to get into the physical realm. With relationships, you know what that does? That blinds you to the real conversations you need to be having. You need to be having conversations about, well, what is, like, listen, let's talk about our past. Not that you say, hey, let's do a body count to see how many people you've been with or whatever. That doesn't determine anything. That doesn't determine anything. But it's, okay, what direction are you going into? What's the state of your life right now, right? What is your biblical worldview right? What do you practice? And you have to be able to examine that person. Step back, get out of, remove yourself from the physical attachment and examine their life. Examine the pattern of their life, the direction they're going in. Examine the direction that the people around them are going in. Who holds them accountable? What kind of teaching do they come up with? And who's discipling them? Have they been discipled? Those are all important questions right? Are they actually, do they have the self-discipline? Are they holding down their own personal finances, right? Are, are they watching pornography? Are they, they say, are they someone who says, yeah, I was watching pornography, but I'm a part of a conquer group now, and I'm making sure that I'm living my life free of that kind of sin. That's not a person that you can't be in a relationship with. That's a person that you need to be able to, to see that, uh, hey, are they in a pattern that says that they are walking uh, separate and apart from you in a way that they're walking in freedom from their past, not do they have a sully pass. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, make sure that, you know, and, and when you get into that relationship, don't go into a relationship thinking, 
that you necessarily need to dig up everything in their past, right? That's not, that's not healthy or wise for you. That stuff is under the blood. Their sin is not against you. First of all, who are you that you need to rectify their past? Their sin is against God, right? And they need to rectify it before God, but make sure that they rectify their own issues with God, right? And that's the, the, the pattern of their life. And you'll see that by the maturity level that they walk with. You'll, you'll know that. And, and like I said, so important that you reserve. I taught the, I taught the middle school ministry this, and I'm, I'm you know, let, you know, wrap my, my little piece up here with this. I taught the middle school ministry this, that those, those Greek words for love. We talk about eros. We talk about phileo. We talk about agape, right? And, and you know, the storge, family love. And so when you get into a relationship with somebody, the world bases their relationship based on eros, the erotic, the physical erotic love, kissing and touching and hugging and what they look like and ooh, like the sensual. That's a terrible foundation for a relationship because it will not sustain itself. Because guess what? That actually diminishes over time. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to sully your hopes for your marriage, you know, but I've been married 25 years and, and, and I still love my wife. She's beautiful. She's fine. All right. <laughs> and I still. They're, they're looking pretty good too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I still like to enjoy myself with my wife and you should. Okay. However, it diminishes. We don't spend all our time in lovey-doveyness. We're spending time in life, right? And you make time for the lovey dovey, but you don't spend all your time, you know, with with hugging and touching and and and, and yeah, feel goods, right? And so that's a bad thing to, to 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 base your relationship on. And so you build your relationship on agape, which is love that goes beyond anything that gives you anything. It's all about what's best for everybody involved. That's agape love, Christ love. You build on that foundation, and then you add to that phileo. You want to get to know that person and like them. You want to be with a person that 40 years down the road, you still like them, right? And that's somebody that you want to, but you're not going to know that if you're spending all your time in the physical realm, in eros. Get out of eros. Let eros sleep. Don't awaken eros until it's time to go beyond the veil. Keep eros asleep and dwell in the realm of phileo, friendship, Storge, family, make sure your family is involved with your relationship that you're involved in. Make sure your family is involved. If they come from a family that has some dysfunction in it, that might be okay. But learn what the dysfunction is because that's going to determine some of the things that you might be dealing with when you get down the road. Right? How have they been able to deal with some of the dysfunction that they had in their own family if they come from a family that has a, so let's say, hey, I come from a single parent home. There's some dysfunction there. And Pastor Gary said, every family has some level of dysfunction. Right? Nobody's family is perfect. Okay? However, Dwell in the realm of phileo, friendship, storge, family, right? And agape, which is we're doing what's best for each other. And what's best for you is not for me to be touching and hugging and squeezing and kissing on you right now. It's to keep you pure. And it's to make sure that we're talking about the stuff that matters so that we can see clearly going into this what kind of decision we're making. And if this is not for us, if you walk away from it and say this wasn't for us, the will of God is not for us to get married, then you're going to walk away not with a feeling of regret and with a feeling of that like I've left something here that should have only been reserved for marriage anyway. You can walk away with dignity and say, you know what? This wasn't the best for us. God's decision, the best thing for us is not to do this. You may be for somebody else. I'm going to continue to pray for me, for you as my brother and my sister in the faith. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. Um, Brian, a lot of us are asking, what does it actually mean to be unequally yoked? You know, we hear that phrase thrown out. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about it. Um, is it first or second Corinthians? And someone specifically in that context is asking, um, is it okay for a Christian to date or marry a Catholic? I have my own thoughts, but I want to hear yours. No. No. Mm -hmm. that, is, that would be the definition of being unequally yoked. Unequally yoked meaning if you're going in a direction of biblical orthodoxy and doctrinally sound judgment and doctrinally sound truth, what is true? What do we believe about the truth? And if you're going in a direction that says with somebody who's a Catholic, wait, they believe in, in, in baptizing their baby. You don't. I hope you don't as a Christian because there's no biblical foundation for that. They believe that you should go confess your sin before a priest. You don't. I hope you don't as a Christian because you understood that you're a priest. They believe that they, their sins can be paid for in purgatory. Right. You don't. Right? So look, at, you can go a, lot, a whole lot of line of this is what they don't believe and this is what you believe. And how can you two walk together unless they agree? Right. Right. That's unequally yoked. It's also unequally yoked. So that could be someone, I was talking to a couple who came to me, she, this girl, uh, we were at church, and she said, can I talk to you in the ministry room? Can you pray for me? And my, and my uh, boyfriend, you know, and, and we want to talk to you or whatever. I said, okay, cool. I met the guy, and she said, hey, I'm a Christian, I believe in the Lord, but he's Muslim. Come on. 
I said, no, there's no, nothing else to talk about. I'm going to pray for y'all, but you need to separate right now. He's a Muslim. He's never going to believe what you believe. Yeah, but he's a good man. No, he's a good guy. That may be true for some Muslim girl, right? But he's, he's, he believes in a false religious system and a false God. And that's going to be a detriment to you. Now, unequally yoked not only means that anybody else of a false religious system or false belief or doctrinally unorthodoxy, doctrinal unorthodoxy, that's unequally yoked. But you can also be unequally yoked if you marry somebody who's spiritually immature because they're not going in the same direction as you either. You kind of want to marry up right, in a couple of ways. <laughs> you want to marry up spiritually. I mean, and so you say, well, if they're more spiritually mature than me, then at least your husband needs to be a person who is on par or on fire, who is doctrinally sound enough to lead your family. Right? Don't follow a man who you got to teach him the word. You're making the wrong decision right there. Okay? But follow a man or a man, follow a woman who, who prioritizes her Bible above all. Right? And you say, okay, that's a good place to start. That's an equal plane. In other words, you're not necessarily at the same spiritual maturity level necessarily, but you're not going to be here and somebody up here. They're, they're, they're at like square one knocking on the door of salvation and you're running full 100 miles an hour for Jesus and they don't even know like Christianity 101. No, it's not a person to date. I'm talking like, hey, if you're running a little bit and sometimes this guy, this person might be running a little bit faster than you and you're learning from them and then you're kind of growing together, right? That's a good relationship because you can, you can benefit from one another. But not a person you got to drag along. You hear and they hear. No, that's unequally yoked, right? Because y'all going to be butting heads. You're trying, to, you're trying to give faithfully to the church and they want to keep the money and, 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 play, and pay for stuff that's frivolous. And you're trying, right, and they could be a Christian, but they're not running at the same pace, right? They're not running in a direction that they're growing in a way that's going to benefit you. So that's another tier of being unequally yoked. So many good questions coming in. Maybe we take the next 10, 15 minutes, Pastor Brian. I want to stay on this course of relationships. Many of us in this room um, are engaged to be married. And we have a few uh, newlyweds in the room as well. What would be your biblical counsel, wisdom, or advice for those who are engaged or newly married? So engaged, newly married, biblical counsel, advice. Okay, so number one, um, so I'll tell you like my pastor told me when I, we were counseling to get married. So how many of you have heard of this triangle paradigm of relationship? At the basis of the triangle, there's you, there's the other person. Horizontal, right? So Pastor Austin talked about that horizontal, those horizontal things, horizontal relationships. Okay, then at the pinnacle of the triangle, there's God. Okay, let me tell you something. If you're at the always operating at the horizontal, always operating at the basis of that triangle, whether you're getting ready to get married or you got married, if you're always operating there, you're going to butt heads eventually. That's where arguments happen, where we're butting heads here. Because at the basis of the triangle, you're right and I'm right. And each one of us wants to have our own way. But we both have to yield to the pinnacle of the triangle where God meets both of us, where we both have to come up to where God is. Ultimately, we may disagree about the finance direction. Ultimately, we may degree, disagree about certain things about the children. But then we got to say to ourselves, we have to have the spirit of God in us that helps us to yield to the Holy Spirit in us, right? He has to, the, the Holy Spirit in you causes you to yield to the will of God and says, okay, we don't agree there. What does God's word say? And then one of you has to yield. And, and typically he calls the wife to be able to yield to the spiritual wisdom of the husband as they both yield to the will of God as it relates to his word. Am I following? Is everybody following me? Okay. So if you're not willing to yield on those both levels, number one, both of you yielding to the word of God, and then ultimately you as the wife yielding to the, the scripture says, in all things wives be subject unto your husbands. If he is submitted to the will of the Lord, he's, if, the, if that man is submitted to the will of the Lord and he's conveyed that, he says, honey, here's what God's word says. And then you have to step in line and say, OK, yes, yeah, that is what God's word says. And then you're submitting to that. He didn't call you to unconditionally submit to every single thing that comes out of your husband's mouth. But what he did say is that you must yield to him as he is yielded to the Lord. And if he's invoking the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit and you can clearly see that, yield yourself. And because guess what? If both of you are coming at each other at the, at the base of the, tri at the triangle horizontally, somebody's got to have a right of way. It's God first, then the husband. And if you don't agree with that, don't get married. You feel what I'm saying? Okay. Um, there's a question that, that someone just sent in. How can we gain better control of our thought life and our minds? Mm. Um, 
a lot of us think that, um, oh, I just want to get married. So basically like my thought life can just run wild. Listen, this is, this is a question, not just for those who are single dating and married. This is for all of us. Cause the Bible says that even God knows our thoughts. Right. And so what biblical wisdom could you share with us, Brian, on how to tame the thought life? Mm, mm, mm. So I'm laughing. You saw me laughing, right? Somebody thought marriage was going to be the cure for that. <laughs> no. So, so here's what the scripture says. The scripture says we have to learn to take captive every thought to bring it to the obedience of Christ. How do I do that then? So I know that that's what I'm supposed to do, but how do I do that? Here's how you do that. Number one, you have to have your mind renewed. I want you everybody to say this with me. You have a bad mind. Yes, you do. You have a bad mind. That's why your mind needs to be renewed. That's why Paul admonished us in Romans. He said, to have, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Your mind is bad. Every single one of us. We have thoughts and thinking and ways of doing things that are bad, and we have to be sanctified. We have to put those things off, and we have to be in a constant war and a constant task, a constant uh, 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 effort to take down every thought that comes captive. Listen, every thought that comes to your head is not yours. Some of it comes from outside of you, outside influences, demonic influence. Some of it comes from your wicked heart, right? But you don't have to actually give in to every single thought that comes past your mind. You don't have to give into it. But what you have to do is you have to have a defense system. And that defense mechanism is the word of God. You've got to cast down. What did Jesus say to Satan when he came to him and tempted him in the wilderness? It is written. It is written. It is written. And you have to, that's why Paul would say to the Ephesian church and the Colossian church that you have to be filled with the spirit. And the synonymous term with that is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You got to have so much of that word in your mind that that's what you regurgitate when it comes to that moment of decision. When it comes to that thought, and we're going to have thoughts, people. I had some doozies of thoughts just in the past couple of days. Some doozies. <laughs> and I had to cast them down. I'm like, oh, that's not of God. Elaborate. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we don't want some to doozies, right? And so we can think of some crazy stuff. Oh, some st crazy stuff can come past your mind. And you have to cast it down. Recognize that they, are, they don't have a right to exist rent-free in your head. Right? But you can take God's word and weaponize God's word to attack that thought and say, no, that's not of God. God's word says this, and I will not give into that. That is offensive to God. That is demonic. That is wicked. I will not give into that thought. It is written. And the first thing you have to do. And then the next thing you have to do is have a consistent prayer life where you're talking to the Lord. That's why you're a believer who's a priest, because you got to come before God and come into his presence. You got to be a worshiper. You know what replaces thoughts? A greater thought. And a greater thought than your own wicked thoughts is a thought about how great God is. You got to magnify God in your vision and you got to worship him. Be a worshiper. And I guarantee you, when you become a worshiper by lifestyle, by habit, then you'll begin to cast down those thoughts more frequently and more effectively because they can't last when the greatness and the glory of God is filling your heart and your mind. All right, let's go rapid fire. Five minutes, Pastor Brian. Um, what does the Bible say about tattoos and piercings? And because you've been talking a lot about Old Testament. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot... Uh, you know, not a lot, but Leviticus is one of those books that says like, hey, don't mark your body. What are your thoughts on sure. it though? Yeah. The law of God is the law of Moses and the law of Moses is not what we're under. However, the biblical principle is that all things in moderation, the Bible says all things are lawful for me, but not everything benefits. And so you got to determine in your heart, why am I doing this? Am I doing this to have some sort of display for the world that leads me to pride because I want people to look at me and say how good I look and because this makes me look a certain way? Or does this honor God because it honors the temple of God that dwells the Holy Spirit that lives in me and it honors the God that I serve? Make that decision based on how does this honor God? How does this make me more mature in the faith? Or does this benefit me because it makes me look in a certain way? And is this related to my pride? And if that's your reason, don't do it. If that's not the reason, because you simply have the liberty and you understand it's not sin against God, then that's okay. You can do it. There's no, it's no law that says you can't. But understand your purpose why. Everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Yeah, the context, too, of that Leviticus passage is marking your bodies specifically in a pagan context Correct. as well. Pagan worship. So it was, pagan, it was a form of pagan worship. And obviously, under the New Covenant, it's, a, it's your conscious, conscience before right. the Lord. Um, that was well said. Um, what, do you, what do you tell someone who's experienced church hurt? Mm. Number one, understand that church hurts you, not God, right? God doesn't hurt people. God may hurt your feelings. Because guess what? Hurting your feelings means you can't have that. 
Yeah. And I'm telling you, to deny yourself hurts. But when you talk about church hurt, church, understand that people are messy. It's people that hurt you. And guess what? Church hurt is rooted in, in forgiveness and the need for forgiveness. You need to forgive people because they're sinners. They're messy, but God is merciful. God is good. And you need to remind yourself that God is good, but these people are messy. They need forgiveness. That's why Jesus died for their sins, just like he died for mine. I'm going to forgive them. And it may take a process over time, but God demands and commands that I forgive. He said, because if you forgive men on earth, then your heavenly father in heaven will forgive you. Forgiveness is a mandate. There's nothing that they've done to you that's worse than everything you've done to God and the reason he had to die on the cross for you. Remember that. All sin is against God. Their sin against you is a sin against God. And there's nothing that they've done to you that's greater than the sin that every single one of us have collectively put on Christ that he had to die for and give his life because he's sinless. Again, God is, Jesus Christ was the only one who could be claimed to, claim to be a victim because he who knew no sin became sin and became guilty of the very sin that we committed and he died for it. He suffered pain for it, real pain for our sin, right? All right, so there is. Um, what would you, what counsel would you give someone who's um, experienced some, experiencing some family conflict or family tension? Specific example, um, there's a sibling in the family who is not walking with the Lord. Uh, maybe they're in a toxic relationship. How? How do we handle family tension without coming across as judgmental or better than? And I know this is rapid fire, yeah. so that's that's kind of a, a potentially a longer answer right, to a right. question. But, but if I could give you a quick answer to that, pray, pray for them, right? Intercede. You're a you're you're a priest, so one of the jobs of the priest was to intercede on the behalf of others, Pr intercede for that person, and tell them very clearly. I'm, I'm going I'm to pray for you. I'm going to go to God on behalf of the situation. This is difficult. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God leads you in the truth in that situation. I want to pray that God leads you to healing in that situation. I want to pray that God's best for you in that situation. Tell them that you're praying for them. And then hopefully that opens up conversations that you can have with them. If you can share wisdom from the word of God that would help lead them out of that situation. That's great. Uh, two more questions. Uh, we have some teachers in the room. You were a teacher for 20 yep. some years. What um, encouragement would you give um, us teachers. Some of us are teachers in the public school system. Some of us are teachers at Cornerstone Christian Academy. What advice would you give for teachers? Again, bring your ministry into that classroom. You're there as a minister. Teachers are government employees in, in the Christian realm, in the Christian you know, school realm. Uh, they're still agents of you know, the ministry of God. But in, even in public schools, just like government workers, and you know, Paul said, we pay taxes for this purpose that that police are ministers of God and people who who, who pol uh, police the land and, and, and do things to keep people safe. As a teacher, you're instituted by tax dollars, right? You're put in place by tax dollars and supported by tax dollars to teach children. So do that faithfully and look at it as a ministry because you're a minister of God given to the state as, as a part of the state. To, in, to, to not indoctrinate, right? Because we know that that's evil, but to help children understand how to live, how to learn, how to think, right? Not what to think, but how to think, right? Teach them in a way that, and you're ultimately, you know, doing a, a covert operation. Pray for them. Pray over your classroom. Invite the Holy Spirit into your, into your classroom and your space. And then when children come into your space, they're going to meet the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, mercy, temperance, goodness, faith, right? That they're going, to encompass, they're going to encompass that in your classroom space. Last question, Pastor Brian. Some of us in the room are either new to the faith or newer to Christianity. Um, what's... What are some practical ways really to grow in the Lord? And yeah. you've really touched on, on, on it throughout answering these questions, but some, some things for the, the newer person in the Lord um, to kind of grasp in their, in their walk. Pastor Austin mentioned that our church offers one-to-one -one discipleship, one-to-one -one for women, one-to-one -one for men. I encourage you, woman or man, seek out one-to-one -one discipleship. Get discipled. Have someone walking with you, right, that can walk you through what the tenets of being a disciple means, what the scripture says that you should be doing, right? To, to, to challenge you to get in and, and navigate the word of God for yourself. You need someone walking alongside you to be able to do that, right? That's what being a disciple is. And so understand, uh, have someone in your life that you're doing that with. And then I encourage you to plead with God daily. God, make me a person of prayer who loves prayer, who loves your word. Because it's gonna be prayer through the word that you're gonna develop again that understanding and knowledge of who God is in your life, and what he what he does, what he doesn't do, and to be able to, do, to discern God's voice as you're being, as others are coming alongside you, you're seeking God alone, right, for yourself. 
and then go to church. You cannot be a Christian on your own. You're not an island unto yourself. The enemy wants to isolate you. Yeah. That's where you're a part of a flock. God calls you sheep, a part of a flock. And wolves know that they can tackle and attack sheep who are stray. Don't be stray alone. If you're going off to school somewhere and you're like, oh, I don't have my church fellowship, find a fellowship somewhere locally and collect with the body of believers who can walk with you. Don't sit up by yourself because that's when the enemy and your thoughts and given the Bible says a man who isolates himself is a man who's going to be given over to his own ways. Right? Don't isolate yourself. Fellowship, connect, get with people who can walk with you. Pastor Brian Shannon, everybody, give it up.